Bonsoir à vous et bienvenue à cette cérémonie 20. Welcome to this 2023 ceremony. À cette cérémonie 2022 du prix Martin Hennels pour les défendeuses et les défenseurs des droits humains, nous avons énormément de plaisir à vous retrouver ici en personne. C'est pour ça que nous avons dérogé à la tradition de se voir au mois de juin pour avoir l'opportunité d'être là en personne et d'avoir l'opportunité aussi de rencontrer bien évidemment les courageux lauréats comme chaque année, les trois lauréats qui méritent notre attention. Et je vous remercie d'être ici. C'est important, cette présence que vous avez ici aujourd'hui dans la salle ou en ligne, derrière votre écran. Elle a son importance pour mettre en lumière le fantastique travail, le courageux travail que font les lauréats du prix. Et à ce propos, je vous demanderai ce soir de ne pas photographier, de ne pas faire de vidéos pour des raisons de protection des personnes qui sont dans cette salle. Welcome to the 2022 Martin Ennals Award, exceptionally in June, for the ability, for the possibility to gather together, to be, to live together this this ceremony on, in this hall and online. In a moment, we'll introduce you to our 2022 very brave laureates, and I will ask you to refrain from taking pictures or video. We are in the presence of the prestigious guest officials, friends of the Martin Enel Awards. Alors, nous voudrions particulièrement saluer la présence de Madame l'ancienne présidente de la Confédération, des éminents membres du corps diplomatique de Monsieur le vice-président de la ville de Genève, des membres du conseil municipal de la ville de Genève, soutien indéfectible du prix depuis des années. Sachez aussi que la Haute-Commissaire des Nations Unies aux droits de l'homme vous rejoindra par message vidéo tout à l'heure, mais pour tout de suite, nous rentrons dans le feu de l'action et je passe la parole au président de la Fondation, Martin Hénard, Philippe Pura. Foundation, Mr. Philippe Curat. Il faudra qu'on me laisse vivre après m'avoir fait tant mourir. Tels sont les derniers vers écrits par Théophile de Vio du fond de sa prison dans une lettre à son frère qui s'ouvre et se referme sur ces deux vers. Trop libre et irrévérencieux dans son verbe, trop acharné à combattre l'intolérance, incapable de se plier aux contraintes classiques imposées par Malherbe, il devait être éliminé. Les conditions de sa détention, terribles, détruisirent sa santé. À peine libéré, il mourut le 25 septembre 1626 à 36 ans. Dans un colloque organisé hier avec l'Académie de droit international humanitaire et des droits humains de Genève, des proches de nos lauréats ont témoigné sur le thème « Don't forget about us, strategies for resisting long-term detention of human rights defenders ». Ils ont rappelé que la santé de Pham Duan Chang, détenue au Vietnam, d'Abdul Hadi al Khawaja à Bahreïn, se dégradait du fait de leurs conditions de détention et que le père Stan Swamy en Inde est décédé en détention. Il y a 400 ans, comme aujourd'hui, les personnes qui s'expriment trop librement font face à la répression pénale et à la détention que le verbe doit être puissant quand il appelle tant de répression. Il faudra qu'on laisse vivre Pham Doan Trang pour qu'elle puisse continuer de porter la liberté d'expression et d'information en tant que journaliste au Vietnam après l'avoir fait tant mourir dans une prison où elle est condamnée à rester neuf ans pour la faire taire. Il faudra qu'on laisse vivre Daouda Diallo afin qu'il continue à documenter les violations des droits humains au Burkina Faso dans l'intérêt commun après l'avoir fait en mourir sous les pressions et les menaces. Il faudra qu'on laisse vivre Abdul Hadi al Kawaja pour porter les libertés fondamentales à Bahreïn après l'avoir fait en mourir en détention depuis dix ans. Il faudra bien qu'on laisse vivre également le message et la mémoire du père Stan Swamy après l'avoir fait en mourir dans le fond d'un cachot. Il faudra bien qu'on laisse vivre toutes celles et ceux qui, 
ici et partout, maintenant et toujours, milite pour préserver nos droits fondamentaux dans toute leur universalité après les avoir fait en mourir par l'oppression et la répression pénale. Depuis presque 30 ans, que le prix Martin Hennels est remis Martin Award pour la première fois en 1994 en à Harry, Vu, Harry Vu, qui avait mis à jour le système concentrationnaire en Chine. S'il y a un point China, sur lequel nos 60 lauréats partout unites, dans le monde se rejoignent, c'est sur leur expérience de la détention. Partout dans le monde, Worldwide, les conditions de détention des activistes des droits humains sont mauvaises, destinées à les briser, them, à les faire taire, them, à nous affaiblir to toutes et tous. Même en Suisse, Even in Switzerland, la répression des activistes du climat démontre que nul pays no en ce monde n'est exempt de reproches quand la garantie de nos droits fondamentaux, le libre exercice de nos libertés fondamentales, est en jeu. En honorant nos lauréats 2022, celles et ceux des années passées, toutes et tous les activistes d'hier, d'aujourd'hui et de demain, ici et partout, nous appelons à les laisser vivre, à nous laisser vivre, à cesser de les faire, de nous faire, tant mourir. Femme Doan Tong est notre première lauréate pour être présentée à vous aujourd'hui. Detained in Vietnam, where she is serving a nine-year prison sentence, she cannot be with us in person. Her mother, Mrs. Bui Thi Can, her fellow journalist, Mrs. Quinn V. Tran, and Mr. William Han and Guyen are here on her behalf. I am pleased in the name of the Martin and Alts Foundation to welcome them with you this evening and to present Pham Doan Trang's work in the film you are about to watch before presenting them with the trophy that will bring her back to life. Đến năm 14 tuổi, tức là năm 82, 1982, thì ở Tây Ban Nha có cái World Cup gọi là España 1982. Thế nhưng mỗi, mỗi lần mà muốn xem đá là anh tôi cõng tôi đi sang nhà hàng xóm cách đó khoảng, gọi là hàng xóm là người quen đấy rồi. Và cả khu quay vào đấy xem tivi năm 1982 đó là nhà thứ nhất tivi màu thế nhưng mà sau khi lại trong cái tivi đẹp thế quần áo mọi người quần áo cầu thủ cỏ xanh quần áo màu cỏ quần áo cầu thủ màu sắc đẹp màu vàng màu xanh màu gì và tôi thấy nó hoàn toàn khác thế giới tôi đang sống nghèo thì tôi bị tình cờ trở thành nhà báo thế nhưng tâm của quan tâm thì đến chuyện xã hội và kinh tế vĩ mô à, càng ngày thì nó càng càng giải đáp được dần dần những câu hỏi của tôi những cái điều mong muốn của tôi từ từ nhỏ nhưng cuối cùng tôi cũng nhận ra một điều là nghề báo cũng không đủ và tôi cho rằng là cái nghề chúng ta gọi là nghề hoạt động dân chủ hay hoạt động xã hội hay nhà hoạt động chính trị hay nhà hoạt động cá nhân sự nó là một nghề nó không ở bối cảnh của việt nam một nước độ tài như việt nam thì 
không chắc là nó thay đổi được cái gì bởi vì đảng cộng sản nắm quá chắc mọi thứ dân trị mà thế nhưng mà so với người báo thì nó nó có thể tiếp cận trực tiếp hơn có nghĩa là mình thấy cái sai và cái bất công thì mình đấu tranh thay đổi nó chứ mình không phải lòng vòng và chờ đợi câu trả lời từ ai khác nữa tôi nghĩ rằng là đó là lý do khiến tôi dần dần trở thành một người hoạt động thì biểu tình bảo vệ cây xanh bảo vệ môi trường ở hà nội bảo vệ môi trường và minh bạch họ tấn công họ gây hậu quả là tôi bị gãy hai chân tôi là nó gọi là tràn dịch không ngối và mà tôi nghĩ là hành tật bị nhiễm cả hai chân chỉ công an còn tung tin rằng là cái việc tôi bị gãy chân ấy, có là do hồi trẻ ăn chơi chắc táng chuỗi lạc quá cho nên bị giang mai And then in 2016, she also joined a protest and writes about the Formosa environmental disaster in Vietnam. The company admitted that they improperly dumped the waste towards the ocean. The company from Taiwan actually agreed to pay 500 million US dollar. From the evidence the government has against Duan Chang for her upcoming trial, a report on that incident is being used as evidence against her. Mình không phải người hoang tưởng, mình không có ý ảo tưởng đến mức rằng là ngoài bút của mình có thể thay đổi, thay đổi chế độ hay là làm cho bọn quan chức thì phải sáng mắt ra, dân chúng phải sáng mắt ra, mở mắt cho nhiều người. Thật là một suy nghĩ, tôi nghĩ đó là một suy nghĩ thực sự là viết thì vì mình muốn viết và mình có một hy vọng thay đổi được một ai đó giúp được ai đó với mình thể chế là yếu tố khiến nó hỏng làm hỏng từ thể chế hỏng nó dẫn đến văn hóa chính trị hỏng đến văn hóa dẫn đến dân tộc tính cách dân tộc hỏng không có dân tộc nào đẻ ra lưu manh đã thích nói to thích nhổ nước bọt ngoài đường thích thích ăn cắp vặt hay là thích thích là bố người khác nó hoàn toàn là do môi trường nó là do thể chế làm cho họ trở thành bệ hại tôi muốn thay đổi cái đó tôi muốn tôi muốn thay đổi cái thể chế đó để cho để cho người Việt Nam được sống được hưởng những điều mà lẽ ra họ được hưởng Vậy cho nên tôi rất rất mong muốn là cái việc đi tù của mình hay của các bất kỳ một nhà hoạt động nào khác nó phải mang lại một ý nghĩa gì đấy nó phải có tác dụng thật sự là một sức ép ngược lại đối với chính quyền để buộc chính quyền phải thay đổi để buộc cái nhà nước cộng sản phải thay đổi chứ nó không thể là cái để nhà nước cộng sản để lợi dụng chúng tôi không phải là hàng hóa để nhà nước cộng sản đem mặc cả với nước ngoài đổi lấy các tiện ích thương mại hay là các thỏa thuận này nọ đổi lấy những lợi ích, đấy, những lợi ích cho tập đoàn cầm quyền chứ không phải người dân. Chúng tôi không chấp nhận cái địa vị hàng hóa đâu.
and God help you. A proud option and this price. Thank you very much. Nous allons maintenant avoir l'occasion de dire, de partager quelques mots avec Mme Oui. Avec ma collègue Vi qui va nous permettre. Je ne suis pas en train de parler, je vais vous expliquer que vous serez capable de traduire pour nous. Merci de faire ça. Et nous allons gagner, qui est aussi un collègue de Pham Dan Trang. Merci beaucoup pour être ici avec nous. First of all, I wanted to point something that your daughter doesn't even know that she's got an award tonight uh, because you can't speak to her. She is not allowed to have communications in her prison. So it must be very special for you to get this award for her. microphone yeah it, it, it's okay we can speak you can yeah. translate afterwards but it's good to hear her voice mình tôi rất là vui sướng tự hào và tôi sung sướng bởi vì tôi để con gái tôi được giải và tôi đến để nhận giải nhân quyền quốc tế năm 2022 thay con gái vì con tôi đang bị cầm tù cho tới nay là Kém 4 ngày đầy 20 tháng, tôi chưa được gặp con. I am very happy and proud to be here to accept the award on my daughter's behalf. And um, short four days, she had been held in prison for 20 months. And I have not seen her since because I was not allowed to visit her in prison. But I'm very happy and proud to be here today. Everyone who knows your daughter seems to say she's got this incredible quality that she inspires people how what's your experience as, as a mother of the energy and the inspiring power of your daughter thì tôi rất là tự hào và tôi rất yêu thương con tôi tôi cảm thấy nó là một con người phụ nữ can đảm cháu đã kiên định kiên trì đi theo một con đường một con đường đó biết là rất là nguy hiểm và gian khổ nhưng cháu vẫn dấn thân đấu tranh không mệt mỏi cho đất nước Việt Nam có được dân chủ nhân quyền cho người dân Việt Nam được tự do hạnh phúc Trang đã phải vượt qua tất cả những cái đợi uy lực của chính quyền trang kiên cường dấn thân để đạt được cái mục đích đó còn bản thân tôi là người mẹ thì tôi đã phải hy sinh tính mẫu tử để cho con tôi hoạt động và tôi cũng hy vọng một ngày nào đó càng sớm càng tốt đất nước Việt Nam có dân chủ có nhân quyền người dân được tự do hạnh phúc I think there's no need to speak the language to understand your emotion, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, as the mother of Pham Dong Chang, I'm very proud of her and the work that she's been doing. Um, she had been very courageous and persistent to continue the work that she's been doing because she wanted to, uh, Vietnam to be a democratic country and the people would have human rights to enjoy. Um, as a mother, I... I I would sacrifice the relationship between me and Jang, but Vietnam would be a democratic country. V, maybe explain to us, because you're a journalist as well, yes. like I am, but yes. you couldn't be working in more different circumstances as I am here in Switzerland. Right. What is, what is, how can you work as a journalist in Vietnam? 
Um, I would like to say that today I've been attending the award ceremony and I've been in Geneva to witness uh, the advocacy for human rights in Vietnam. And for press freedom, uh, many people have asked me when did it became so bad? And I know that with the downturn of the liberal democracy in Southeast Asian country with the Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, so Vietnam seems like it joins the ban. For, unfortunately, Vietnam had been a country with the worst press freedom like forever. I was born in Vietnam, I grew up in that country. I know press freedom we have is the top five from the bottom up. So Vietnam is in the same range as China, North Korea, uh, but people did not know about it. So working as an independent journalist are very difficult in Vietnam because you write and you publish um, against the censorship of the government. And, and you know, we have to, to, to speak truth, write about fact, and hold the power accountable. But that is a very difficult job in the country. And as you can see, that's what Jang has been doing, being a journalist, and, and now she's suffered nine years imprisonment. So that's the price that we pay for it. But the good news is, even though Jang was arrested, our newspapers are still ongoing, and there are more people who would write for us. So I think that's good and that's bad. The tighter the restriction, the more that we want to work on this. Will Wynn, you're also a colleague. And can you maybe tell us a little bit more about the situation in Vietnam regarding it's not only the freedom of the press, of course, that's in question. It's much more than that. Right. So rights like freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, these things are guaranteed in the Vietnamese constitution. Whether the party respects them is a whole other issue. I know when people think of Vietnam, they think of the war, but what they often forget is the outcome of that war. Um, the Vietnamese Communist Party won and united the entire country under a Soviet-style one-party authoritarian state uh, with a security apparatus that was actually formed with the help of the East German Stasi. That post-war state survived the fall of the USSR and exists to this day. So when you think of Vietnam, we all know it's an economic powerhouse, but please remember that it's a political fossil. So maybe we can ask you, in your opinion, here in Geneva, what can we, as the public, as citizens, can we do something? Well, I think you guys being here is an excellent first step. So I do want to thank all of you for your presence, as well as our uh, online friends. Um, the next step, the next step, The next step would be to speak to your lawmakers, your diplomats, your community leaders, and let them know that the rights that you enjoy here in Switzerland and in much of the developed world are sorely lacking in Vietnam. As Vietnam seeks to become a responsible and active member of the, um, of the international order, I think we have a lot of leverage. And the more light we shine on this issue, the more likely it is that the Vietnamese government will begin to treat its citizens with dignity and respect. Thank you so much for sharing Thank you. all these and these emotions as well with us. Je passe maintenant la parole à Alfonso Gomez, le vice-président de la ville de Genève, Gomez, qui va annoncer le prochain lauréat. Who is going to announce the next laureate? Mesdames, messieurs. C'est évidemment un, un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole à l'occasion de cette cérémonie de remise des prix Martin Ennals. Cette année encore, la remise de ces récompenses permet de porter la lumière sur des personnalités comme vous pourrez le voir hors du commun, des femmes, des hommes d'exception qui luttent euh, au péril de leur vie, au péril de leur liberté, pour le respect des droits fondamentaux. Partout dans le monde, mesdames et messieurs, ces femmes, ces hommes, 
Ils sont gentlemen. des centaines, ils sont These des milliers. Ils sont pourchassés, criminalisés, torturés, emprisonnés in, et même tués en raison de leur engagement pour la dignité humaine, pour la défense des droits démocratiques et pour la défense des droits environnementaux. Et face à cette réalité qui nous est intolérable, il est impensable de ne pas agir, de ne pas se mobiliser. C'est en tout cas le parti pris de la ville de Genève qui s'engage avec détermination en faveur des droits humains et qui est heureuse d'être cette année encore co-organisatrice de cette cérémonie. Ce soir, mesdames et messieurs, j'ai le très grand plaisir de vous présenter le deuxième lauréat du prix Martin Enas 2022, le docteur Daouda Diallo, pharmacien de formation responsable du laboratoire médical du centre hospitalier régional de Dédou, où le docteur Diallo fait face à la guerre sans merci, cette guerre que se livrent depuis plusieurs années les groupes armés islamistes, les forces de sécurité de l'État et les groupes paramilitaires du Burkina Faso. L'escalade de violence a provoqué une terrible crise humanitaire avec plus de 2 millions de civils déplacés et une détérioration marquée de la situation des droits humains et cela dans une impunité presque totale. C'est dans ce contexte complexe, difficile et encore aggravé par le récent coup d'État militaire du 24 janvier dernier que le docteur Diallo s'engage avec un immense courage et une incroyable conviction pour la défense des droits humains et la promotion de la paix au Burkina Faso. Et cela jour après jour. Il documente sans relâche les violations des droits humains qui sont commises par toutes les parties au conflit dans le cadre du collectif contre l'impunité et la stigmatisation des communautés, collectif qu'il a créé en 2019. En adoptant une approche humaniste, holistique, son travail facilite l'accès à la justice des victimes, des atrocités, facilite l'accès à cette justice aux familles, dans une volonté intangible de justice et surtout également de réparation. Aujourd'hui, le docteur Diallo représente une source d'inspiration, mais aussi une source d'information indispensable pour les organisations internationales et pour les médias. Son engagement lui vaut, hélas, d'être menacé par tous les acteurs du conflit et cela le contraint à vivre dans la clandestinité. Bien qu'il travaille dans des conditions qu'il expose à une grande vulnérabilité, le docteur Diallo reste engagé dans la protection des droits humains et son courage a inspiré de nombreux autres défenseurs et défenseuses des droits humains à rejoindre son combat. Docteur Diallo, votre détermination, les, voies, les valeurs que vous défendez, ces valeurs de lutte incessante pour réconcilier les différents groupes ethniques et confessionnels de votre pays forcent l'admiration et ont particulièrement touché le jury du prix. Vous faites, à ne pas douter, partie de ces êtres humains exceptionnels qui font passer leurs idéaux de justice et de paix avant leur propre sécurité, leur confort, et leur propre leur liberté. Et leur propre Je suis donc particulièrement heureux que vous receviez ce prix ce soir. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous invite maintenant à découvrir son travail et ses engagements en images. Au premier jour de l'an 2019, les valeurs de solidarité, de fraternité, d'humanité tout simplement et les marqueurs identitaires indélébiles de son peuple ont été mis à mal. Dont l'anniversaire est de ceux qu'aucun peuple, aucune nation ne voudrait avoir à célébrer. Plus de 200 enfants du pays ont été massacrés. Il y a lieu de demander une minute de silence à la mémoire de toutes les victimes que notre pays enregistre tous les jours.
Parce que quand dans un pays, il est plus facile d'avoir une arme que d'avoir une bouteille d'eau, il y a lieu de s'inquiéter. Moi, c'est docteur Daouda Diallo. Et je suis secrétaire général du collectif contre l'impunité et la stigmatisation des communautés pour la protection des populations vulnérables qui sont pris en étau aujourd'hui par les groupes armés qui sont en train de dévaster le Burkina Faso. Très tôt dans la matinée, autour de 5 heures du matin, le chef de Yirgu, cinq autres membres de sa famille ont été assassinés par des hommes armés non identifiés. À la suite de cet assassiné odieux, les membres des milices armées se sont ont dirigé un grand massacre contre une communauté précise, à savoir les peuples, et en visant essentiellement les hommes. Le massacre s'est étalé sur un rayon de 50 km, a concerné 50 villages. Les cris de détresse me parvenaient de partout et de tous les côtés. Il y a eu des marches populaires partout pour exiger, exiger vérité et justice pour les victimes du massacre de Yirgu et plus jamais ça dans notre pays. Je suis ici des métissages. J'ai un côté peu, j'ai un côté moi aussi, j'ai un côté eh, bizarre. Et du coup, je peux dire que c'est cela qui a même milité en faveur à l'adhésion à mon appel pour créer le collectif contre l'impunité et la stigmatisation de la communauté. Une grande coalition inclusive, ouverte à toutes les communautés pour faire face à la situation difficile que nous vivons. Je suis docteur Diallo Penenta. Je suis un docteur Diallo Penenta. Je suis un docteur Diallo Penenta. Je suis un docteur Diallo Penenta. Je Ces milices d'autodéfense qui sont parrainées souvent par ces, par ces décideurs me menacent nuit et jour. Ils ont même diffusé mes images à travers les médias sociaux pour dire que je suis la personne à tuer parce que moi, dans mon rôle de défense des droits humains, je protège les terroristes. Il faut dire que c'est comme si je vis dans une prison qui n'est pas délimitée par des murs, mais mon engagement pour les droits humains me donne une satisfaction immense parce que je me rends compte que de par mes efforts avec mon équipe, on arrive à secourir les victimes de violences, les victimes en détresse humanitaire. Ils ont une soif intense de secourir à la vie humaine, à la dignité humaine.
En réalité, les Burkinabés sont aujourd'hui vraiment unis. Et en réalité, si on fait des efforts, on sera plus unis à l'avenir. C'est pour moi un immense honneur de vous transmettre et de vous Thank remettre you. ce prix que vous avez cerné du jury du prix Martin 2022. Okay. Well, merci. merci à la Fondation, Thank merci à la ville de Genève. Et ce prix, c'est un effort que ça nous interpelle à plus de persévérance pour la protection des droits humains and, uh, et c'est aussi l'occasion pour moi de penser à ceux qui sont actuellement en prison and, uh, à cause like de l'instabilité des pensées des droits humains. Je pense qu'il faut tout mettre en œuvre pour sauver ces personnes. Merci. Docteur Diallo, ça fait longtemps vous avez pensé aux autres, ça fait longtemps que vous battez pour le droit des autres, puis tout petit, pour savoir qu'est-ce qu'aujourd'hui un prix comme celui-ci représente. Représente pour vous ok, euh, merci. Thank you. Il faut dire que euh, pour moi, ce prix, c'est un titre, c'est un mot très fort qui honore euh, honor. mon pays. Qui honore tous les défenseurs des droits humains dans le monde. Et c'est une invitation forte à plus de persévérance, à plus de détermination et d'engagement face aux défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés en termes de droits humains et pour la construction de la paix dans nos différents pays. Pour développer la paix dans nos pays et promouvoir les droits fondamentaux. C'est ce que je peux dire sur ce award. Merci. Yes, in Burkina today, the film gave us an idea of what the country has been experiencing. What is the situation today and what could happen? What do you fear could happen in your country? I have to say that uh, my country that uh, has been uh, suffering for many years because of uh, undue governance suffered a coup on the 24th of January 2022, a military coup that uh, came with a message, a message that democracy was to be restored and that the population was to be unified. And this gave citizens huge hope. But today, sadly, we have to observe that this power is in trouble because protecting human rights is not actually with the reality that we are experiencing in the field today since January. We've observed over 200 cases of violation, human rights violations, and that is very worrying. It is the occasion for us, the opportunity for us, to call on all the experts, all the experts in Geneva, the International Geneva, which is a reference to come and to help our country, to avoid our country, to avoid our country getting uh, getting worse and deteriorating further in its governance. Your association is called Collective Against Impunity. Why impunity? Precisely. Well, against impunity because a country represents, it's like a compass. It is to respect laws, it's a constitution, and like the Pope John Paul, John Paul II would say, the trees in the world are to be watered with the water of justice. So that's why I think we need to pay particular attention to the trees in the water. 
you have had uh, death threats, you live in a very difficult situation, you live underground, and uh, you have been accused of terrorism. You have been discredited, you uh, are fighting for your survival today. Are you sometimes discouraged? Well, when fighting, there are always times when we are desperate. There are times when it's very difficult. But there's also a number of moments that may be encouraging. And when we think of all these victims who benefit from our support and our accompaniment and our medical assistance, our psychological assistance, our legal assistance, humanitarian assistance, when we think of everything that's done of all these international NGOs that are in the field to come in aid to all these people, widows and orphans, then I think that it is really worth it and it's our way to pursue this fight. I, you saw that all my staff is praying for me and my organization, and there are thousands of people that are calling on us, and they are praying for us and our organization. So hope is there, and we hang on to that hope in order to succeed in our fight. Dr. Diallo, thank you very much, and I imagine that meeting people who share your fight is also important to you. Yes, it is crucial for me to know that worldwide there are people who have values and people who, like me, fight regardless of the circumstances, the conditions, the environment, the political environment for fundamental rights to be to become a reality, for human dignity to be respected, to be valued, for human life not to be penalized. I think it's well worth it. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Please stay seated. The Martin Ennals Award is uh, the choice of a jury that is uh, composed of 10 most important NGOs and organizations in terms of uh, defending human rights, and the president of which is Hans Tulens, who is here, and to whom I give the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, chers amis, <coughs> in 1992, I and a number of friends of Martin Ennels had the idea to create an award in his name. Now, 30 years later, as you can see on these glasses, it is encouraging to see that it has so well developed, but also a bit shocking that there is still such a need for a protection of human rights defenders. The fact that, again, two out of the three laureates are unable to be present here shows the need for attention to the problem of continued long-term detention. The, aut the autocratic governments clearly count on public opinion, that is you, to tire of the issue and to stop paying attention to those who pay with their freedom. I think we should not fall for this. <coughs> One of the, this year's laureates is Abdul Hadi al Kawaja. He is a Bahraini Danish, Dan, uh, Danish leader of freedom and democracy. His dedication to human rights started already when he was a student in London, and he never stopped. He received asylum in Denmark with his family and continued his advocacy work documenting human rights violations in Bahrain. After his return to Bahrain, he publicly denounced human rights violations that he thought were committed under the prime minister and the monarchy. He, Al Kawaja, also with other human rights defenders in the region, co-founded other human rights organizations such as the Bahrain Center for Human Rights and the Gulf Center for Human Rights. In February 2011, during the Arab Spring, 
al Khawaja led several peaceful demonstrations and pushed for democratic reforms across the MENA region. Bahrain's monarchy hit back with violence, and in April 2011, he was arrested, disappeared for two months, and was tortured. In June 2011, after a military trial, he was condemned to life imprisonment. This April marked the 11th year that he is in prison. And even in prison, al Kawaja organized multiple hunger strikes to secure the rights of detainees, and this, of course, took a tremendous toll on his health and his well-being. I do not have the time to list all his achievements or all his sufferings, but I don't have to, because others, in particular his children, are totally devoted to his cause. I think it is a pity that the term Godfather has been so tainted by the 1972 film about the Mafia, because al Kawaja really deserves, in my view, the honorary title of the godfather of human rights in the Arab region. He has inspired his own four daughters, three of whom are here in the room, and a whole generation of young activists in Bahrain and beyond Bahrain. He encourages his fellow political prisoners and he's a shining example of, for human rights defenders all over the world. So I think you will see more about his work in the film. Thank you. In Bahrain, you have to either be with the regime or you have to pay a price. So if you say, we don't have rights in Bahrain, you're inciting hatred. If you speak out directly about the king, that's another case against you. If you're calling for democracy, for them, that is terrorism. Being the eldest daughter, I was very interested in what my dad was doing. And I would come and check what he was doing, and I'd see lists and lists and lists of names, and then their ages, and they would be as young as 12 and 11, 13 year olds. And then next to them, it would say like the date of arrest, if they've been tortured or not, if there's enough details about that. And I remember asking him to help him make those lists. My father never asks people to do something. He leads by example. He is excellent at translating um, his empathy into work.
people were afraid to say the names of the people in government. They were afraid to say the name of the prime minister or the king. One of the things my father is good at is breaking that fear. He had a mission to show people that you can speak out. They're ruling us with fear. We have to fight. In 2011, like in many countries in the Arab world, a revolution happened in Bahrain. Over the years, my father had been working to teach people how to take a stand, what their rights are, and how to demand those rights. By doing that, my father and others around the region, they planted the seeds for these revolutions to happen. And at one point when I was in Bahrain, I was in prison with my son Hadi. And at that point, it was three generations of my family in prison. And I kept asking the prison administration if we could have a visit with my father. Finally, they came one day to my prison cell and they said, get up like it. your father's being brought here. And he came in his prison uniform and I came in in my prison uniform and he had police with him and I had uh, prison guards with me. And I can't even describe to you the feeling of him like taking Hadi from my hand and like playing with him. I think what pains him most in this world is when he feels helpless to help others. That is the most painful thing my father can experience. He can take being tortured, but he can't take other people being tortured and him not being able to do something about it. I tried very much to ask the committee, my family, my friends, and the committee, not to concentrate on me as a person or my release, but to concentrate on the main goal, the people's rights. Thank you, thank you very much. I think it is really a very, very great honor that I can hand over the award to Khadija, the wife of thank you our very much. glorious. Thank you very much. Lady. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just would love to say that every single person sitting in this room is a unique person because you care for human rights and this is exactly what Abdel Hadi would love to see. So Abdel Hadi is not forgotten and every single human rights defender is not as long as you people are working on that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here tonight and your husband will be with us because we have a very special uh, recording that we want to share with everyone. Um, it's a recording, it's a message sent from prison to you. Um, I ask for your patience because it's not extreme, the, the condition the, is not extremely good and it's not been recorded in great condition. So, you have to bear with us, but it's a very personal message and it's very special to hear the voice of your husband tonight. Let's hear it. For over 40 years, Khadija has been to me an ex extraordinary wife and friend. She has been my everlasting love 
and my closest partner in joys and difficulties. She has been the main pillar of our family and the source of tenderness and stable well-being. Khadija is not just a loving wife and a devoted mother. She has always been a source of wisdom and strength. Khadija has been the one who gave most and suffered the circumstances most. Nevertheless, she has never wavered or complained. And what a coincidence. If my name, Hadi, is written, it is just a single person. But if Khadija's name is written, it shows two in one. Thank you, Khadija, for everything. I love you forever. Thank you. You are definitely the right person to get this award tonight. You've been sharing so much, you've been sacrificing so much. I don't think I can call it sacrifice because I've always lived a beautiful life. I married Abdel Hadi when I was very much in love with him. I have four beautiful, amazing girls. And uh, me and Abdel Hadi always tried to get the best out of everything. Every time he went out for his work, he usually told me that I might not come back. And I would always tell him, I have so many lovely hours with you that it's okay. And when he proposed, the first thing he said to me was, you have to live with being always the second wife. And I was, oh, what do you mean? He said, working for human rights and defending people is my first wife. So do you agree to be my second wife? And I said, yes. And I never regret it. For 40 years, I'm still the second wife. I'm very happy to be so. Mariam, um, you are his daughter, and we had to think about listening to this recording with everyone because it might have some consequences, because it might be forbidden maybe to talk to his family later on. Is that a possibility? Of course. I think that uh, when it comes to Bahrain and when it comes to human rights defenders in Bahrain, you know, one of my favorite quotes of myself um, is that if you ever want to know the human rights situation in any country, ask where their human rights defenders are. And in Bahrain, they're either in prison, in exile, or under travel ban. We no longer have any civil society space. It's been completely obliterated. And as such, it also means that the defenders who are currently imprisoned and my father is not the only one. Um, they also have their b very basic rights in prison eroded. And that means that even the most basic things like access to the bathroom, like access to books and papers and pen, like access to phone calls with family, are used as reprisals, are used as ways to humiliate and treat people in an indignified manner. And this is part of the reason that uh, they're so angry with my father, to the extent that they've been denying him access to medical treatment since January, even though he needs it um, a lot for the torture that he was subjected to, as well as the multiple hunger strikes he's been on. Because my father, even in prison, refuses to cow down, refuses to bow down to them. He refuses to, to step back. If they increase their oppression, he increases his resistance. And even if it means that he has to use the last resort that he has, which is his own body. This award that he's getting tonight, it's for him, but it's, it's even bigger than, than this, than his person. Yes, for sure. I think, you know, as was said in the introduction, um, one of the, I mean, interestingly enough, and I think you saw this also in the film, uh, one of the first things my father said to us when we told him about the award was, make sure that this spotlight is used to shed light on the cases that you don't hear about. 
make sure that those who don't get named, th th those who don't get seen, um, are, are remembered, are mentioned, and so on. And this is exactly who my father is, that even after 11 years, even, after, uh, even while he's suffering from chronic pain um, and lack of medication and lack of access to medical treatment, his thoughts are always with others. His thoughts are always, well, if I'm getting some spotlight, I am going to use that to make sure that those who don't get that spotlight are seen as well. And so I want to take this moment to also mention the hundreds if not thousands of prisoners of conscience, not just in Bahrain and in the region, but around the world, you know, people like Ala Abdel Fattah in Egypt, who's on hunger strike currently fighting for basic rights. Or, you know, Mustafa Ali in Syria, who's been disappeared for many years now in Syria. Um, or, you know, the prisoners of conscience in Palestine and, and so on. And we have this all over the world, people who are serving long sentences because regimes bet on the idea that they will be forgotten. So the Martin Ennels Foundation, I think, with this award have proven through my father that they are not forgotten. Do you, do you also want to use this spot of light to maybe point the finger to say that we might have, as citizens of Switzerland, of the Western world, we have also a responsibility? Anyone who knows me in this room <laughs> knows that you're playing my tune. Um, <laughs> I think yes, definitely. I think, you know, when we talk about human rights, whether in our region or other parts of the world, a lot of times the way that it's talked about is, well, look at what's happening over there. Look at, you know, how they're unable to build democracies or preserve and protect human rights. When the fact of the matter is, is that even as a Danish citizen, as a European citizen, I've seen over, I've been doing advocacy for about 11, 12 years now, and I've seen time and time again, European governments, you know, the United States government and others turn down our requests for them to do better around human rights, especially in the Gulf and Bahrain. When it comes to um, be short-sighted and prefer their security deals and their economic deals and doing business as usual over the rights and freedoms of individuals and the populations in our countries. And I think, you know, another um, thing that I like to say always is if you want to really know if a country really upholds the ethics and principles of democracy and human rights, don't ask how well they apply it to their, to their enemies. Ask how well they apply it to their allies. And I think when it comes to that, when it comes to the Gulf states, Europe and the West generally fails miserably. And I do not believe that ethics and principles are the cornerstone of their foreign policies. Khadija, I want to ask you a last question because your husband's now facing a life sentence. And uh, even though we understand that he has this great spirit and energy, how do you keep the hope alive? How do you go on? Um, last time I heard this question, my answer was I have uh, stored so many uh, beautiful, lovely times with Hadi that during this 11 years, um, I never felt he's in jail. He's always with me. We are always together, even though he's in Joe and I'm, where am I? Um, exactly where he is. I feel he's so close that I never miss him being around me because he's there. And you never lose hope, you never need no, energy. When does, people does it bring... ask me, uh, when is Abdel Hadi is coming out? I say, well, we've finished 11 years. We have 14 years to go, but yes, I never lose hope. And being in a place like this with people who are sharing some of your values, that does, well, does it my, my do My case, when I see this lady's case, mine is nothing. Mine is nothing, because I'm a mother. Uh, Seb, Zainab has been in jail for seven times, I think, and every time she was in jail, I was, it was much more difficult. So I can feel for her. I know being a mother is difficult when your kid is in jail. That's very difficult. I'm sure But it being is. a wife, it makes you strong. Yeah. Thank you very much for your lesson of wisdom. And thank you.
Thank you all for sharing some, some, some of your life and some of your wisdom and lessons of life. Thank you so much. Excuse me, I'm getting a little emotional myself. I now call uh, the head of the uh, Martin Reynolds Foundation, who is also at the heart of this organization, Isabel de Sola. privilege of announcing the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, who couldn't be with us unfortunately this evening, but she's transmitted a video message to all of you here today. Thank you. I'm honored to be invited to address you tonight. The Martin Ennals Award has for many years shone light on the brave individuals who work to defend, protect, and promote human rights law. I would like to thank the organizers and the jury members for your efforts to reinforce their work. This award stands for the courageous battles hard fought by human rights defenders across the world. The three laureates we honor tonight have actively chosen courage over convenience. They have swum against the current with the sole intention of exposing truth about discrimination, oppression, injustice, and violence. They have given and continue to give human rights a true meaning. Dr. Dauda Diallo fearlessly works to expose human rights abuses and to combat impunity in Burkina Faso. Fang Duang Tang is a Vietnamese journalist and staunch advocate of environmental rights, transparency, expression, and free speech. And Abdul Hadi al Waha is a leading figure in the Bahrain human rights movement fighting tirelessly for equality and against discrimination of minorities. But they pay a heavy price. All three have experienced persistent threat and intimidation. As you know, both Fang Duang Trang and Abdul Hadi al Waha are currently in long-term detention, separated from their loved ones and deprived of their rights to work for positive change in their countries. Too often, the tension of human rights defenders represents a brutal and unacceptable act of revenge. Retaliation for doing something fundamentally human, seeking to achieve a better future for all. Human rights defenders all around the world frequently work in perilous circumstances. They are often falsely vilified as traitors, propagandists, and terrorists. In 2021, the UN recorded 320 deadly attacks against human rights defenders, journalists, and trade unionists in 35 countries. Over half of defenders killed or disappeared across the world were leaders of peace and communities and land and environmental defenders. Every day, numerous other human rights defenders are harassed, intimidated, arbitrarily detained, and imprisoned, and physically attacked and humiliated. Speaking out enables people to effect change when they and the people they represent face discrimination, violence, and injustice. Criticism and debate do not constitute terrorism, security threats, plots or propaganda. They are tools to identify grievances and make for better policies. My office is committed to protect and expand the space for the millions of legitimate voices who use human rights as a tool to improve the world we live in, especially those who are often overheard and left behind. Minorities, migrants, people with disabilities, older people, LGBTQ people, women and girls, to name just a few. We know that meaningful, safe, and inclusive participation is a real game changer. Together, we need to ensure this is the norm, not the exception. Together, we must respond more firmly to attacks against civic space and human rights defenders and to say no to impunity. While there are a growing number of effective initiatives to improve protection for human rights defenders, that is never going to be sufficient. We need all governments to recognize and value the role of activists and activism and respect and protect their rights. As the human rights community, we need to amplify pressure to ensure their security, their ability to work and participate, and their freedom. Dear friend, they stand up for us. We must stand up for them. Today, let us acknowledge their immense sacrifices to preserve our human rights. Let us continue to be inspired by their exceptional courage, 
and to act with pride and with urgency to protect their space to speak. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you very much, uh, High Commissioner. There is also another story of activism that we would like to share with you this evening. Every year, the jury, the Martin Nettles Award jury, receives many nominations of human rights defenders who fight worldwide, but only three of them can be can actually be laureates. So that means that sometimes. Uh, the prize is not awarded to uh, others who could get the prize, who are not or don't arrive in time to be protected. So today we received a, a nomination for Stan Swazi, a Jesuit priest based in India. But before being able to come and receive the award, Father Stan sadly passed away. So now I'm going to call on Xavier Soaring, the Father Xavier Soaring who is going to uh, testify of the determination and the work of Stan Sadi. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Martin Edels, jury, board members, all fraternity of MEA. I'm very happy to be here tonight to share a moment together in honor of Father Stan Swami. I remember all his friends and colleagues back home in South Asia and uh, particularly in Tharkand and Ranchi. I'm proud to mention one name, Brinda Grover, who is present here for this occasion. I'm very happy that she has made it to this occasion. Born in 1937 in Tamil Nadu, Father Stan Swami attended St. Joseph's School and was closely guided by the Jesuit priests. He went on to study theology and sociology. The two subjects informed his advocacy on behalf of marginalized communities in India for the rest of his life. At the age of 32, Father Stan was ordained as a Jesuit priest. As part of his training, he spent two years at St. Xavier's School in Chaibasa, interacting closely with Adivasi students. Adivasi communities are the indigenous tribal inhabitants of India. As farmers and hunter-gatherers, they are considered to be the forest's original landlords. In the Jharkhand state, Adivasi tribes have a special history of clearing and protecting the forest. But Jharkhand is also the site of India's major coal reserves. Adivasi communities historically have been uprooted from the land in the name of coal mining schemes. They receive no compensation for the destruction of their habitats. Their protests have been labeled as anti-state. They are called as Naxalites and Maoists, accused of inciting terrorism and violence. Against this backdrop, Father Stan advocated for educating and empowering the Adivasi communities. Although he had the option of pursuing a doctorate, he committed himself to working for India's marginalized peoples. He believed that educating the oppressed would create a culture of resistance. He wanted to legitimize the Adivasi knowledge of environmental sustainability. To bring them closer to political change, Father Swami founded important advocacy centers and human rights organizations. In June 2001, a section of the Agriculture Training Center campus was gifted to Father Stan Swami by the Ranchi Jesuit province. He coined the name Bagaicha, taking inspiration from the Hu tribe vocabulary. Bagaicha signifies a harmonious garden where all species can thrive. He conceptualized Bagaicha as a social action center and a platform for organizations to coordinate plans in the protection of the oppressed local communities. Father Stan was arrested under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA, on October 8, 2020, for his alleged links to the Bhima Koregaon violence. He was 83 years old already and suffered from Parkinson's disease. 
Poor prison conditions and the absence of medical attention exacerbated his deteriorating health. The High Court in Mumbai repeatedly denied him bail. He spent nine months in jail until 29-2020 May, when his condition became critical and he was finally transferred to a hospital. Father Swami passed away on July 5 at the age of 84. Father Stan left us a tremendous legacy. He broke ground and paved the way for sustainable development for all the India's ethnicities. Forced displacement of Adivasi communities still occurs in the context of economic development projects. But Father Stan's spirit, courage and kindness continue to inspire communities to reach for their rights. We will never forget you, Father Stan Swami. You live in our hearts and continue inspiring us. Merci beaucoup, Martin Ennals Foundation. Thanks to everyone present here. It is nearly the end of our evening. I would like to thank you, those who are here with us in person, those who are behind the screen. I would like to say that moments like uh, we are experiencing tonight are hugely important. We have to spread the word. You have to uh, talk to people around you and to uh, promote the award because it allows us to shed light on people who give so much for human rights worldwide and that we all have the opportunity to participate and help them defend human rights and lead their fight. Uh, thank you. And you have another little assignment. also like to thank um, many diplomats who may be in the room or who may be watching us who quietly and persistently made it possible for our special guests to travel here with visas, with security arrangements, with meetings. Um, and last but of course not least are the, the wonderful teams behind the lights, the sound, the chairs, uh, the staff of the foundation that has proven to be incredibly resilient and uh, Cristina, Raul, uh, Hakam, and Carla, thank you so much for bringing us here this far. So one last thing, one last thing. Um, perhaps I can ask the board and, and the jury to join me on stage, and Mr. Gomez, please, while I say this one last thing. <laughs> um, and actually, may I ask all of you to stand? You must be wishing to stand <laughs> for the <laughs> after being si seated for a long time. So one more thing. The, the ceremony tonight was about finding inspiration. Um, Father Xavier told us about a bagaisha in India, a garden where all kinds of species can thrive. And you'll find on the chairs in the hall some small leaves that have been made by volunteers and we would like for you to help us decorate a Geneva bagaisha that is waiting for you in the reception hall at the back. Take your leaf and write an inspiration that, that touched you this evening or something that you'd like Father Stan to hear or something that you'd like our, our laureates to hear. Um, what, we, what we'd like to do is remember Father Stan Swami in joy. Um, tonight we heard all kinds of messages of, of inspiration in these stories. We heard that, you know, prison is not silence, you know? And we heard that crisis is an opportunity for peace and unity. And I think from Father Stan, what we hear loud and clear is that death is not forgotten 
and it doesn't mean that love ends. Love never ends. So with a round of applause, let's please remember Father Stan and our wonderful laureates. Thank you. And now we're going to take pictures right here. Anyone even say anything? I think that you can now go to the buffet unless you want to uh, take a picture of the stage. Thank you very much.